right. Here we go. Welcome, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Our third Tech Talk and our final in the series with Warren Jobbit. I'm AJ Leeming, your uh, your host from CSI Ontario. I'm a member of the board here. Um, and, and if you've not joined us yet for one of these, thanks for checking out Tech Talks. Uh, if you've sat in for the previous two sessions with uh, Warren and myself, good to see you back. The previous two sessions are still hosted online for you. So if you haven't had a chance to check those out with your registration tonight or your registration to previous sessions, you can log back in and review that content from the previous two sessions. So uh, feel free to check that out if you have not yet had the chance to. A um, little bit about Big Marker. So the, uh, the, the forum that we're using tonight to pre present this content is designed. It's a little different than Zoom or Teams, where you've likely been spending most of your days over the last several months. Um, so Big Marker is intended for hosting and sharing this type of content. You can have pre-prepared videos. Um, it enables things to stream a little bit quickly or more quickly and, and hopefully more smoothly. Um, it does take away the ability to have all the participant videos on, so you're not looking at all your friends right now, and, and we're sorry for that. Um, but it does allow you to focus in on the content that Warren will be sharing with us here momentarily. Um, there's a few other functions that I wanted to make sure that you were aware of. On your sidebar, I'm not sure if everyone's screens formatted the same way, but you should have on the, the right-hand side of your screen um, a chat window where you can connect publicly with everybody. You can reach out directly to the presenters, both Warren and myself. You can contact individuals that are on the call this evening privately if you'd like. Um, and then next to that, you'll have a Q&A tab. And the Q&A tab is a great place for you to post up questions. So if, if Warren triggers a thought for you this evening, that's a great place to post your question. Um, and then what I've got the ability to do is, is post that question publicly to the group so everyone can see it, see it, and I'll do that closer to the end of the session this evening. And once those questions are posted up, you'll be able to see that there's potentially similar questions from others or a question that you might have that somebody else has already asked, and you can like and promote that question. And so Warren and I will try to tackle sort of all the top level questions as we wrap up tonight's session. So by all means, stick around after the formal portion is uh, complete, and we'll get into a little Q&A. Uh, next to the Q&A, you'll notice there's a poll section, and I'm going to run a couple of polls right now for you. Um, so you should see a poll pop up now available to you asking about whether you were able to join us last week for session number two. Um, we're also going to check in to see a little bit about where you're joining us from. Um, so I'm going to post a poll now to see where you're sitting in from this evening, what region or potentially internationally. And then finally, I've got uh, some curiosity about how much time you've had on snow this year, partially because I'm jealous. Uh, we at Glen Eden are not yet sliding, but hope to be very soon. And last but not least, a question for everyone this evening uh, about what you might be interested in hearing in future Tech Talks. Uh, or if you happen to know other presenters who would do an awesome job, we'd love to hear from you. So that polls tab will stay open. You can answer those questions now. You can push them aside. You can you can click away and put some detail in as the session runs this evening. And then the last section to check out would be handouts. And in handouts right now, there are three documents up for you. Um, there's a do document from Warren about this evening. That's the Tech Talk number three handout. There is um, the CSIA uh, Ontario Scholarship and Bursary Program. Um, and that is there for you to check out. If you are a member in Ontario, CSI Ontario has been working with our national um, board to make sure that we've got a little bit of a, a heightened bursary and scholarship program available to members here in the region. So if you're looking for some assistance, check that out. And then finally, to CSI Ontario members, we've got a flyer from our partners at Good Life, um, and they're offering some uh, pretty sweet discounts if you're looking to uh, join the gym, maybe a New Year's resolution. Uh, a great way for you to save on a new membership, or if you are currently a member, uh, to engage some savings on uh, on your membership there with Good Life. So those are some of the, the tabs that are available to you. Um, if you have questions, remember to shift those from the chat over to the Q&A. Um, and we will try to flag things as we go throughout the evening. So I'm not going to ramble too much more, but uh, on behalf of CSI Ontario, and the board, I wanted to extend a, a huge happy holidays and best wishes for the new year to everybody. Um, this will be our
our final tech talk prior to 2022. Um, and I know we're going to have lots of busy family and friend time coming up. So I, I wish you all the best. Um, I hope you have a very safe and healthy start to the new year. I know uh, COVID sent us all for a little bit of a ro roller coaster ride lately. And I, I hope everyone's feeling well tonight um, and stays that way over the next many weeks um, so that you get the most out of your ski season. So thank you so much for being here again this evening. And I'm going to pass it off to Warren, our presenter tonight, for him to say a few things and take us into tonight's contact. Thanks again. And Warren, it's all yours. Thanks, AJ. Hello, everybody again. Uh, thanks for joining us here, you know, just a few days before Christmas. I haven't started my shopping yet, so I'll get on that uh, hopefully tomorrow. But uh, yeah, thanks for joining. We have had, uh, you know, as you know, three tech talks. You know, our first one started out with us talking about, you know, getting rolling at the start of your season. Some of the things you want to do to keep you focused and, and get you started. So your technical basics are, are rolling right away and, and a way to kind of get your mindset uh, ready for the ski season. Then last week we moved into, you know, how do you build a training day? Because that's what we like to do. We like to, we all like to get better. Uh, I'm always trying to, to add something to my skiing. And that was kind of the big point last week was trying to add a piece to the puzzle, something that you're not currently doing. And so now this week, we're going to talk about how you're going to self-evaluate. I mean, we're out there a lot. We may or may not be with our course conductors or our snow school trainers or, you know, somebody, you know, said something on, on YouTube that you wanted to try to add to your skiing. So this is more of a, an approach how you need to, to take if you're going to evaluate where you're at, right, without somebody else standing there looking at you, telling you, that you're getting it better every second. So let's see what's in store for us this evening. Uh, as always, for every training day, there's some ground rules. There's a few constants that I want you to, to wrap your head around. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to enter your training day with a positive mindset. And then we're gonna talk about contribution and effect, not so much the exact moves that we're making, but what they do for us and what they're supposed to do. And then I'm going to throw a little spin at you at the very end, and we're going to flip that around, reverse engineer it. We're going to talk about effect and contribution. So let's get rolling with our ground rules. You will always be you. <laughs> we all have different body shapes where we have different, uh, you know, things that hurt, things that don't hurt. And uh, we're on different equipment, most of us, uh, anywhere from a, a, a slalom ski a you know, race slalom ski up to something that's 110 underfoot that you're, you know, riding the big mountain and, you know, in the back country, that kind of stuff. So equipment has a, a big play in, in what's going on. We're all at a different stage in our personal development. And, you know, one of the ways that we can track our development is using video. And I call it the evil genius. Evil in the sense that, you know, when you're working on something in your skiing, and you think you've nailed it, you think you're looking like your course conductor or that, you know, that hot skier on YouTube, and then you watch your video and it doesn't quite look the same, uh, even though you are progressing and you are developing. That's the evil side and it tends to bring us down a little bit. The gene side is if you use it properly, you're certainly going to find a lot about your skiing as long as your training day is lined up the way we talked last week, and in uh, kind of the, the mental state that you're going to enter it today or you know, from today's presentation. So <laughs> I'm going to show you a video here, uh, Pentaro versus Jabba. And it's by no means do I think that I'm in the, the same category as uh, Crystal Globe winner. Uh, but he is one of the people that I watch uh, his skiing. And I, I look at some of the movements, or the movements that he makes and the outcomes of those movements. And that's what I try to put into my skiing. So I'm going to show you this video here and uh, that'll give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. Here's an example of what I mean by my skiing will always be my skiing and it will always look like me. One of the things I like to do is watch world-class skiers. I like to look at the movements that they make and the results of those movements, where and how they use them, how much they use them, and so on. Here's a comparison video, uh, you know, watching Alexi Pantaro, one of my favorite World Cup ski racers, uh, the moves he's making, and then I'm trying to make the same moves for the same reasons. Now we have to keep in mind that 
you know, the equipment he is on is is different than mine. The the snow preparation it's very very firm compared to the snow that I'm going to ski on. And let's face it, I'm not a world class athlete, and he most certainly is. But let's just take a look here at some of the things that that I like to do and how I try to to work this into my own skiing. So, you know, looking at the, the connection, right? Here, trying to move, balance to the outside ski, watching the moves that Alexi makes, trying to make the same move. And, you know, at the end of the, oops, right? And then from there, right? Trying to see, you know, are there similarities uh, in the way that we've moved and the results of the ski on the surface of the snow. So that's, you know, the kind of the connection area. Then from here, that release, right? Trying to watch, you know, how he bends a little bit. That right leg starts to balance on the left leg. You know, try to you know, make those same movements. Again, not necessarily to look like he does, but to have the same results that he gets. And you can see some similarities, you know, definitely not the exact same, but that's certainly, you know, where I'm trying to go with my skiing. And then the last bit, you know, kind of the platform creation. You know, how does he you know, roll the, the ski over and create a new line of, of inclination in his skiing and a nice solid platform from which then he can redirect his momentum. So, you know, kind of trying to look at the movements and, and add those to my skiing. And again, you know, kind of finding, you know, some, some similarities, you know, again, it's the results of, you know, if you look at the ski, you know, it's doing very similar things as a result of adding the movements to it. However, you know, when I watch myself skiing after I think I look like this, after adding those movements, right? And then I shoot video of myself and I still look like me. However, I've added the movement patterns and starting to get some of the results I'm looking for in my skiing. So, you know, video, evil genius, it's evil in the sense that, you know, when you think you're developing and you're adding a move to your skiing and you're getting the results in the picture you have in your mind. Maybe it's your course conductor. Maybe it's the trainer at your snow school. Maybe it's somebody on YouTube. Uh, that picture you have in your mind, don't forget when you watch your own video back, it's still going to be you. And there's nothing wrong with that because we're all different, right? Different body shapes, different stages in our development. So look for the movements that you're trying to add the results of those movements as opposed to, you know, do I look like a certain skier? Because none of us are ever going to look exactly the same. Excellent. So, you know, it's a, it's quite a, an interesting way to, to look at skiing and, you know, how to use video but always remember that you will always be you. Look for what you're adding, look at the results it's giving you and go from there. So those are our ground rules. Let's get into positive mindset. You know, these six basic emotions, fear, sadness, anger, disgust, happiness, surprise. I put, <laughs> you know, pleasant surprise. Obviously there's some unpleasant surprises, but you know, these, these emotions will, will hit you throughout the day and they stick with you and it really affects your ability to train and to accomplish what it is you're looking to accomplish in your skiing that day. You know, fear is, is one that I didn't really live with too much in, in my skiing, um, you know, as I was growing up. But then, as I mentioned before, a couple of years ago, I broke my leg skiing. And after that, I was afraid for it to break again. Uh, and that was that that changed my skiing quite a lot the the following season. And what I want to talk about here tonight in the positive mindset, um, these are the tools that were given to me when I worked with a sports psychologist and uh, to to help me change that fear emotion and and try to find that happiness in skiing again. So one of the things that we're going to do in our training, and you'll see this, it's in the, the handout as well, is a goal for the day. You know, what would make you happy that day? And we have to be realistic in, that, in those goals. When I'm trying to add 
a new piece to the puzzle, it's going to take time. So potentially on my first training day, my first three hour training block, as we discussed last week, there's a good chance that maybe I just want to be able to, if the move I'm making is going to give me more fe a feeling of more weight underneath the heel pad, then maybe that's my goal for the day. And as long as I achieve that, I'm going to be happy. Okay. Um, from there, because it, these emotions, and even today, if I relive the the fear that I had after my broken leg, those emotions, even right now, if I was to relive the, that moment, they're going to be real at the time. So playing back in your head, things that have not gone well in the past will draw those emotions into the present. And one of the tricks that we can do is we can practice emotional based imagery. And I think of, actually, it's funny, one of my better days on snow was about an hour just before I broke my leg, uh, where I felt super strong. Things were going really, really well. And uh, you know, I remember the, the sound that my skis made on the snow when I had a good you know, run. I remember the, the sense of confidence, right? And those are the, the things that I try to relive and practice that imagery in my head all the time. And practicing that, is as much uh, or as as important as it is to practice your skill or the piece of the puzzle that you're working on. So think of that as you move out onto your next training day. When I meet clients uh, or you know, in instructors, people I'm training, uh, and if I ever ask them, tell me what you're working on, tell me a bit about your skiing, I can almost guarantee you 99% of the time, the answers are going to be, oh, I'm trying not to dump my hip. Oh, I'm trying to get rid of my rotation. Right? Oh, I'm trying to lose the, you know, that I'm losing my grip on my downhill ski. I'm trying to get rid of that. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, to stop sitting back uh, in the bumps. You know, those are like almost every time I ask somebody, those are the answers that come out. And what's funny is if you talk about the negative, that's going to become your reality. If you think about a problem, if you look for it, you're always going to find it. And that's what you, is symptoms, right? We're describing the symptoms in our skiing, the things that we don't like, the things that other people saw in our skiing and told us that was happening. What I need to do in my skiing is figure out the difference between what feels right and what feels different. Because the what feels right is usually attached to your symptoms. It's probably what you're already doing if it feels right. But if it feels different, there's a good chance you're starting to add the piece to the puzzle. So let's look for what feels different. And then we'll start to, and as the slides progress here, we'll start learning how to evaluate whether that is attaining our goal on the day or not. If I choose what my move of the day is going to be, then I'm going to start in the positive side of things. I won't be thinking of the symptoms and hopefully I won't find them as my day progresses. So here are the things I can control. I can control the terrain that I'm going to ski on in my training day. I can choose how far down the mountain I go before I start turning. So my overall speed or rate of descent. I can control the piece of the puzzle that I'm going to add, the movement that I'm going to work on that day. And I can control what I'm going to do next versus what just happened. Because what happened in a previous turn that you didn't like, as an example, or a previous day when you were rotating or dumping the hip, there's nothing you can do about that. So we're switching our mindset so we can focus on what I can control and I can control what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do on the next turn, what I'm going to do on the next run, and what I'm going to do tomorrow. If things don't go well, as I just mentioned, the first trick that I have is to say, so what, and move on. Okay? Analyzing what happened versus analyzing or thinking about what my next move is puts me in a completely different situation in my training. If I'm taking time to think of what just happened on the pitch, you know, where I lost the downhill ski or the grip or what have you, I've now missed the opportunity to think about what I should do so that doesn't happen again. So here's a video of me um, where I talk about skiing into the future.
you know, on that run, I had a couple that didn't quite work out the way I had planned. And, you know, I just laughed, right? Because it's, you know, it's not perfect and it's never going to be perfect. But putting in a little laugh makes things more positive, right? And I'm not going to evaluate why it went wrong. Uh, I know why it went wrong because I didn't do the move I was supposed to do. So if I'm not on my met head, as an example, right? If I'm not rolling over onto that as much as I need to, yeah, I might be in the back seat. Why did I get in the back seat? Who cares? <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, I need to know why I didn't get the results that I'm looking for, add that move and search for those results and evaluate those, whether I did it enough, whether I did it fast enough, maybe soon enough, maybe a little bit later next time. But that's the positive approach that I have to take in my training. Again, it doesn't matter why I didn't get it. Uh, what matters is that I know the move to use on the next arc to get it, right? So then I'm always looking ahead. I don't want to spend any time evaluating what went wrong because then I'm working in the past and there's nothing I can do about what I just did. But I can definitely control what I'm about to do or try to do on my next arc. So that's the plan. interesting way to to look at it now i've never had a run where everything went as planned uh, there's always a turn or two or maybe many that didn't go well for me and i could i definitely can admit that in my earlier days of training i would get frustrated i probably would say some words that maybe shouldn't be said out loud and uh, those things just it, it ruins your entire day right the it takes you back into that you're know, one of those emotions of anger right as opposed to staying in the now and the future analyzing the past has never never served me well so what can i do when i think of the things that i can do while i'm skiing i can create a balanced platform i can change direction i can release that direction change and have a glide I can change my corridor width and I can change how much vertical drop I have per arc. And at the end of the day, that's about it. So our checklist is pretty small when we think of the things that I can do, but how do I actually make this a positive day for me, you know, and be confident in the things that I'm going to do. One of the things I have to do, and I do this every single run, uh, maybe, uh, maybe a few times this winter I haven't, but in reality, I'm kind of always training. I'm always trying to develop my skiing. So you have to be persistent. And anytime you sense or a negative feeling or you, or you recognize a negative result on snow, you have a bad turn, right? That's okay. You know, those thoughts are, they're always going to come into your mind. But when you evaluate your run at the end, you want to out, you have to at least balance out those positives and negatives. So if I had a couple of negative thoughts cross my mind about my run, I have to find at least two, if not more, of the positives. If you find yourself always thinking in the negative, then you're going to go down that road again, right? Of being you know, losing that positive approach and changing the emotion of the day. My thoughts going into my next run, if it's just, hey, you know, a couple of things didn't go go right, but here are the things that went well. And what I'm going to do on this next run is I'm going to do more of the same. I'm going to do it sooner. I'm going to do it later, so on and so forth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The ability to think for confidence is a, it's a skill in its own, right? It's just as, as important as it is learning how to roll your foot over or add a bit of counter to your skiing or bend or turn the skis on the surface of the snow. So at the top of my what went well checklist, and you'll see it in the handout, so please take a look at that. Uh, I'm certainly gonna pick my training goal for the day, right? So um, that goal has to be specific and it needs to be achievable, right? What's gonna make me happy today? How do I assess whether or not my, not just the movements that I'm working on, but that my entire day was achievable. And if I did achieve it, yes or no. I'm going to put in the movement I'm going to write down or mentally note the movement that I'm going to try to work on that day. 
and what that movement is going to do for me. If I think down that road and I'm always thinking, okay, I'm going to add this, this is what's going to happen as a result, then it's going, there's a better chance that it's going to happen, but it puts you in that mindset of where you need to be. So you can actually evaluate exactly what's gone on. So you can tell yourself if you're getting it or not. So what are those things that we're going to add? And here are the ways that I think of my movements and what it's supposed to do for me. So at the bottom of the run, I can actually evaluate what's happened. The connection move. So what is that, right? That's my balance towards the outside ski. Where is that happening? It's happening in the direction change. And I'll show you that in a quick video here in a second. And the outcome, what's supposed to happen? Well, the ski is supposed to bend a bit more and it's supposed to affect my vertical drop. So it'll change how much I go down the mountain before I go across the mountain. So take a look at this in a video. It explains it a little bit better. So let's take a look at the connection. We've talked about this in the previous couple of weeks, but you know we need to know where in the arc. So we're looking in here, right? So where we get to the fall line, right? And how we're the movement here is trying to you know kind of get this you know armpit down towards the outside boot, right? So connecting to the outside that gets the balance of the outside ski. The ski is bending, and that's what's getting us just in and out of the fall line. And when we look at that and we look at uh, you know, the, the zone again, sorry, so in here, right, this area, uh, how fast I make that move and how much I make of that move will change how much vertical drop I might have in my arc. So go from maybe a little bit of a bigger, more drawn out arc to something a little bit tighter in the fall line. So you have to have that contribution and effect when I make this move and how much and how quickly I do it, here's what's supposed to happen. And that's really, really key to be able to understand and look back after your run and determine how successful you were. Great. So there's one, you know, and remember, I, you're only working on one move each training session, right? So, but I'm going to show you, you know, all three here, the release. Right. What is the release? Well, it's you know, there's multiple ways to do it. One of the most efficient and effective ways to do it is there, you know, almost simultaneously, there's a slight bend of the downhill leg and that starts the, the toppling effect. Um, I start to balance on the new outside ski. It looks like the uphill ski at the time, but it becomes our outside ski. Where does this happen? It happens at the bottom of the arc. So just as you're exiting out of the fall line, right. And depending on how much, you know, how you want to, how far down the hill you want to go or how far across the hill you want to go for speed control. But what is the outcome? It initiates that toppling effect and actually starts our glide phase as well. So let's take a look at this one. All right, looking at the release. So from our direction change and all these angles that we have in our skiing, you know, what's the move to release? Well, there's a slight bend of the downhill leg, new balance, you know, towards the, the new uphill ski, which will be eventually become your new outside ski. You know, kind of right in through there, right after the direction change, kind of bottom portion of the arc. And that starts to add a bit of a glide phase to your skiing. So from this point here, where we're exiting the, the, you know, the fall line and the direction change, and we start to release our center of mass, and we end up with this glide from this point to this point here. Okay. Uh, again, the rate that you will make that move and the amount, the degree you'll make of that move will either shorten this glide phase or even lengthen the glide phase. Okay. There we go. Oops, sorry, turned off my camera again. The uh, So let's take a, a look here now, release, and then that leads us into uh, how we develop our platform, right? And that platform, what does it do? We're going from one outside ski and creating a new outside ski. We're using a roll of the foot and that adductor group of muscles to help get that ski to tip over onto its edge. 
that's going to happen after this release. We're still gliding through this phase, um, but it's as the center of mass is over top, you know, coming pretty much right over top of the base of support. What's our outcome of doing this? Well, depending on how much I roll the ski over versus twist it, it's going to determine whether it's going to be a carved arc or a skidded arc. It's going to create our new line of inclination and it's going to start directing the skier towards the fall line. Let's take another look at a video here. Lastly, let's look at the platform creation. So this is happening just after the release as the you know, center of mass here is coming just over top of the base of support. We're using the foot and the adductor group of muscles to roll that ski over onto edge creating a new line of inclination and a solid platform for direction change. You know, we can twist the skis on the surface of the snow through this portion as well, still rolling the foot over, still using the adductor group of muscles, but also just twisting the ski, giving me a bit more of a skidded arc. Or if I need to sharpen the arc or shorten uh, the turn shape as well, that's you know a move that I can add in that point, right? So having a little bit more edge and a little less twist, it'll give you a little bit more of a longer, more drawn out platform creation phase versus something where I might need to twist or turn the skis on the surface of the snow and that will draw me to the fall line a little bit faster. There, so if we don't know the results of the move, if we don't know uh, what it's going to do for our turn shape, the width of the corridor, the vertical drop, then you won't have anything to evaluate at the end of your run. Here's a couple of videos I just did, um, whereby I'm gonna I, I'm talking through uh, as I'm skiing. There's a bit of wind sound and sound of the snow, so you might have to turn up your speakers a little bit on this one. Uh, but hopefully, you get to hear everything that is said in the video. But the first one is going to be me thinking more of the contribution. So I'm focusing in on the move, what I'm doing, how much I'm doing, not as much on, on the effect as I talk through this one, but have a look at how, you know, this is what's going through my head uh, as I'm skiing on this one. All right, let's get early on but progressive because it's flat go over the mat head there it is nice and slow faster so pick up the rate of the roll notice an earlier car lots of grip getting steeper Faster, more, a little quicker rate to the roll. Yeah, so making the movement where I wanted it to be, you know, and just varying the degree and the rate. So how quickly I rolled over on the foot had the ski bend a little bit earlier and that definitely affected the turn shape, you know, in the top half of the arc. Um, I could feel a positive edge grip and, uh, you know, I, I felt like I was turning into the fall line much quicker when I increased the rate and the degree of, of that particular move. And that's the most important piece here, you know, and as I'm starting to evaluate my own run is ensuring that I know you know, what move I was supposed to make, where I was supposed to make it, the results of that move, and now I can evaluate, you know, did I get that some of the time, most of the time, or all of the time? And I'm always looking forward then that way. If I'm always planning the next move and thinking that way, then I'm not so much evaluating what went wrong, I'm just evaluating whether or not it happened as much as I wanted it to. So really results oriented at the end uh, and that's the overall goal, right? Is to evaluate that, the results more so than, you know, the move, because it's hard for us to tell 
when we're making the move, you know, if we do it right. Um, but the results is what tells us if we do it right or not. So that's what we're trying to do here when we evaluate at the end of each run. And I would say most of the time was my result there. I, most of the time I got the, the turn shape that I was looking for. Sorry, so I uh, just got message that the the skiing portion of the video it was a bit choppy. Uh, who knows? A technology these days. So what was happening as I was skiing down the slope there is I was telling, I was saying to myself that you know roll over. I was trying to think of rolling over on the met head to get the the whole ski bending, so the shovel was pulling me to the fall line. Uh, I started on a flatter slope. So was coaching myself saying, okay, I'm going to do the move a little progressively. So the rate in which I moved, I'd still feel the, the balance shift to the outside ski and still feel that top of the arc rolling, right? And starting to, to pull me towards the fall line. But then as the terrain got a little bit steeper and I got going a bit faster, I was saying to myself that I need to make the move a little bit faster as opposed to, you know, spread out and more progressive. And it got steeper again on the second pitch or the third pitch. And so then I was coaching myself to do more of, right? So the degree was a little bit higher. So, and then I think you saw the rest there where, you know, my self-evaluation at the end. So let's try the, the next video here. And this is measuring the effect. So I'm gonna be, as I'm skiing down, I'm gonna be coaching myself on the effect of the move. So being a little bit more conscious of the the move and what that does for my turn shape. Okay, so now the terrain is going to get a little bit steeper. It's going to roll a bit. So I'm going to make the move, the adduction and rolling onto the 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 inside of the met head a little bit faster and a little bit more i'm going to keep it at the same time in the arc and that should help the balance move to the outside ski get the ski to bend and tighten the arc in the fall line so that's the challenge down here so the move and how much and the outcome roll onto the met head i'm getting that grip for sure yeah, there's the direction change. Nice and quick at the top. Now, really fast increase in degree as well. There it is. You know, one of the other key aspects to evaluating your own training is to not try to analyze what didn't go well. You know, when it didn't work, who cares, right? So if you had some of the time, uh, we analyze why you got it the sum of the time as opposed to why you didn't get it the rest of the time. That just takes us into a negative mindset that doesn't really work for our training component. So we want to look at just purely evaluating the sum of the time when I got it, why did that happen, and where you know how can I do it uh, more often next time? What is my positive mindset moving into my next run here, where I'm going to coach myself through the moves uh, that I'm going to try to make for that outcome that we were capturing on the last run. Okay, so you know that is the contribution effect. That's how I measure my my run every time. And again, you pull out the the, the checklist from the the handout section, and you'll you'll go through a series of questions. 
did I make the move? Yes or no. Did I get the feeling of the move that I'm supposed to, i.e. you know, more contact on the front of the boot? Did the move do what I it was supposed to do for me? Was it to feel or get the sensation or notice that I have more grip uh, or potentially you know, a longer glide phase to my arc? Those are the types of things that we're going to be asking ourselves through our, our what went well checklist. And as we do that, I mean, we take that positive mindset that I was talking about earlier on this evening, that will take your day, you'll find more results a lot faster that way. So here's a, a neat idea that I talk about, I'm just going to reverse engineer the contribution and effect where as a, an expert skier, where I think all of us want to be down the road is less thinking about the move that I've got to make and more thinking about where I want to go, right? So if I coach myself through the way we we're talking about tonight, my brain, when I said things in my in the video, such as there it is, you know, you're going to start to recognize that and you're going to start to understand what's happening with the skis on the surface of the snow. And from there, you know, for me, I think skiing is, is basically a huge video game. When I look at a run, uh, I rarely think of the move that I'm going to make. Uh, I think of where I want to go. And instead of saying, here's the move I'm going to make, if I'm, let's say I'm going to a, about to hit a steeper pitch. And instead of saying, well, I better add this move, do it sooner, uh, do it more, do it faster so I can tighten my arc in the fall line so I don't get going too fast. I can control my speed. I might just say to myself, I've got to tighten my arc now. And it works backwards towards the move that you have to make because of the positive training effect that you've had uh, going through the, you know, kind of the format that we've talked about here tonight. So I encourage you all to seek that as the way that you're training. And you can you put that into play further on down the road where you're just out playing a video game on the mountain. So I say game on everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, so just a, a quick review here, and then we'll get to some Q and A, you know, ground rules. You are always going to be you. When you watch video, look for the moves, look for the effect of those moves, i.e. the turn shape, your carved versus skidded, that idea. Uh, don't try to say, don't think that you're going to start looking like your trainer uh, or Michaela Schifrin or Alexi Pantaro. Uh, you're always going to look like you, but you can definitely become an expert skier and a more efficient and a more effective skier. Your positive mindset is going to change how quickly you learn, uh, what you learn and, and the outcome of your day. Always think of contribution and effect. They always work together. That's what allows you to assess and evaluate your run that you did every time. Practice assessing and evaluating your run. Keep it positive. Keep it goal oriented. And then as you continue from there and things start to be a little bit more automated with your new move, then go affect contribution flip that around, ski down the mountain and tell yourself, you know, I want to tighten the arc here. Looking ahead, that keeps it in the future. We never evaluate or assess the past, what's happened. We're always moving forward that way. So thank you again, everyone, for, for joining us here. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working with you for these last few, few evenings. Uh, if you have any questions, by all means, oh, I went past my email address there. There it is. Uh, take a look, warren at warrenjobbit.com. Uh, reach out if you have any questions that don't get answered here this evening. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing you on snow someday. So AJ, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I want to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and safe and happy holiday season. Warren, that's awesome. Thanks so much. Um, we're going to get into some Q&A. Uh, and there's been a couple of questions pop up. So I'm going to post a few of those now just so people can see some of the questions that are coming in. And then Warren, I'll bring you back to those. I just, I wanted to remark on a couple of things, um, just participation wise, I think it's been great to see. We've got members on the call tonight, uh, sitting in on this session from every region in, uh, in Canada, as well as a few joining us internationally, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, new faces tonight and, and a huge return from past weeks. And the, the comments about just people, the things that people are wanting to explore this season with their training, um, tons of really inspirational goals, things that people are wanting to get into. So, uh, you know, chase, chase those down. Um, it's great to see people setting goals for themselves like that. 
And then to uh, my comment at the start, you know, Warren's really kicked this series off for us uh, with some great content. The Tech Talk series is going to continue on. Um, and there's some great suggestions there on future topics. So uh, we will definitely take those under advisement and look at the presenters. Um, James Scott is apparently in high demand. Uh, so James, I know you're on the line tonight. Get ready. You might be next. Um, but we will uh, we will definitely be chasing down more topics and bring those your way in 2022. So I posted a couple of questions up that have already hit the airwaves. So you, you should all be able to see those now. Um, and if you have more, please fire away and we will, uh, we will publish those as they come in. But, um, I think the first one that came in this evening was from Gary and, uh, Gary's looking, um, can you say more about not looking into the past, but skiing into the future, obviously reflecting on our turns and runs is important, but knowing what is working and what's not in our skier improvement. Um, and the more we can bring that reflection into real time as we're skiing, the more likely we are to make timely corrections. This reflecting is critical, uh, not necessarily emotional or negative, but it should inform our skiing and the next turn and future turns. So Warren, I, I don't know if Gary's triggering any thoughts for you there, but talk to us a little bit about that, that um, you know, not lamenting too much on the past and, and keeping the goals and the... Uh, the inspiration coming in your skiing. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gary. Awesome question. You know, the 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 thought process here was not to not check, you know, know the negative or what happened. You definitely have to uh, be aware that, you know, that run or that turn didn't go well. But as opposed to as you're skiing, uh, trying to analyze why that didn't go well, uh, ninety nine percent of the time, it's because you didn't do the move that you were trying to implement into your scheme. If you know, if you see, you know, if I'm like, oh, I'm in the back seat, so what, right? Uh, because if I try to figure out, okay, what is it? Well, okay, I'm not touching the front of the boot. Maybe I'm too countered. Um, maybe you know, I, I started on my inside ski or whatever it might be. All of those don't really matter. Um, because they, they all lead us to symptoms and going way back to one of the early slides, when we get caught up in that, then we end up analyzing our symptoms and we end up trying to fix those, but those are, and we talked about this a bit last week, those are the moves that you own. You have them, they're there. Uh, they may be unconscious. You're not trying to make them happen, but that's how your body's figured it out. So the idea of definitely you need to recognize that you had a, a good run or a good turn versus a bad turn, right? If you don't know the difference between the two, then it's gonna be very challenging to reflect on, on your run at all. Um, the idea of, of reflecting after the fact, right? So reflecting on action, it's called in the educating world. It's, you know, that's where I say, okay, well, you know, this is what happened. I analyze it, move forward. And that was that type of reflection we talked about here tonight is to put you into looking forward to the next run, right? Or the next turn knowing here's what I have to do and here's what it's going to do for me. Again, we're having, a, we've got a very dedicated training day here. Uh, it's not a, just an overall, I'm skiing around and, and thinking of everything that's going on. It's a very dedicated training day. Reflecting in action, as you mentioned in there, that's super important and a part of our learning as well, where that's that recognizing if it happened, if it didn't happen, right? And so that's what we talked about here tonight was as we're skiing along, here's the move I've got to do. Yep, I got the grip. Yes, more pressure. I sense more pressure on the outside foot, those types of things. That's what we're going to reflect upon as we go. That's kind of the thought process between looking and skiing towards the future and not dwelling too much on the past and the symptoms. Excellent, thanks Warren. Um, Luke fired away with a second question for this evening. Um, choice of terrain. What would you say is more likely to be productive if we choose terrain that is significantly, that has significant sections that are uniform, slope for example. Um, for technical training, I gravitate to uniform uh, terrain if I can. Choose ev uneven terrain for tactical training. Can you maybe provide some remarks on, on terrain choice for training, uh, creating that positive positive outcome, Warren, and, and what do you gravitate towards? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Luke. 
As I mentioned last week, when I'm adding a piece to the puzzle, when I'm developing a new move that I don't have in my skiing, always, always, always start as flat as possible and groomed, right? And what I mean by flat as possible is there are some, if I'm adding an expert move to my skiing, something that requires a minimum amount of speed, uh, then of course, you know, that my flattest possible train might be a blue run. But I definitely want to keep it as consistent as possible. But as I get the sensation and I, and I understand that contribution effect, so when I have the desired outcome of the move that I'm adding, then I'm in my technical component still, I will try to find, maybe I'm, I go a little bit faster, maybe a little bit steeper. Maybe I do get into some chop terrain, but that's not necessarily just going to tactical, it's still working on the technical gains. Um, and that way you're going to find, you're going to get to your results much, much faster. Um, you may not hit it 10 out of 10 every time. Maybe I hit it 10 out of 10 on a green run. I may only get it four out of 10 when it gets a little bit bumpier, but you know, using the reflection that we were talking about uh, and our evaluation of our skiing, like we talked about tonight in our previous question, then you're going to know uh, what's happening on contribution and effect, and that is learning, right? So it's not about perfection, it's about learning. The point about tactical, tactical for me is where I decide to turn, um, where I decide to uh, you know, navigate a bump run as an example. So the tactical component, I still train technically, not on perfect groomed easy terrain all the time. And then of course, absolutely, that's that contribution and effect talk again, where I say, okay, now I'm going to take it into the bumps. If I need to go and ski the trough or I need to go around this bump, what move where to achieve that outcome? That I would say is tactical in my approach. Awesome. <clears throat> um, we've had two two new ones come in. Um, so uh, Marshall was following up, remarking on on his his part of Northern Ontario, a little bit vertically challenged. Marshall, I I I can I can uh, sympathize. I, I I understand that sensation. Um, find what when we go to bigger resorts, you can get a good tempo building. You can feel what's going on in a turn but you get back to your local hill and sometimes it's tough to recreate those sensations. So uh, the question was sort of, you know, is there something that I can be working on when, when I'm dealing with shorter terrain or, or maybe not the big vertical um, for my trip west or east or, uh, um, or wherever it might have been? Yeah, good question. You know, um, Marshall, I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario, so I feel your pain uh originally the you know i get it you know, that's you know repetition without you know having a chairlift ride in between it's pretty hard to replicate that in any training approach i always in i i guess my only answer would be uh is going back a couple of sessions that we talked about is definitely be precise in your skiing and intentional so meaning that you know, and maybe you break it down one turn at a time uh, or you know, you kind of make the same move multiple times in the appropriate part of the arc, of course. Uh, but that would give you so know the move that you want to do, know the, you know, the new feeling it, it may or may not give you know the results, it, you know, the outcome, you know, turn shape wise, it's going to do and then reflect on the chairlift and get back up with that same idea, the precision and the intention. And other than that, I don't know that I could replicate uh, 20 turns in a row when my, you know, my hill only allows me to do 10. So um, be precise, ski with intention, uh, get that reflection going on the chair. And uh, when you get off, get immediately right back into it. I think that's the best I can do for you. Sorry, Marshall. That's fantastic. Thanks, Warren. Um, and then I'm not going to miss our, our top question this evening, Lauren. I'll come back to you at the end, but uh, we'll, we'll catch that at the finish. Uh, Ken was asking, how does your equipment, skis for example, change or determine what you're working on in your training? Um, so I, I guess that, you know, Warren, you could frame that up. If, you know, if you grab the slalom boards or GS boards out of the trunk in the morning, um, do, you, do you build your training day around the, uh, the gear you've chosen? Uh, do you allow that to limit you? Can you talk to that for us? 
Yeah, that's awesome. You know, we don't talk about equipment enough and I uh, briefly touched on it a bit this evening. Um, but you're, you're, you're right. You know, every type of ski has a specific turning characteristic, right? Um, having said that, when I talk about, and we talked a bit about, about it last time was, you know, three core moves, right? That move to connect to the outside ski, the move to release and the move to build a new platform. They are all there all the time. Um, they, and then, you know, adding the, the our part-time move, that twisting of the ski on the surface of the snow, you know, that's there if and when you need it. Now, whatever ski I put on, if I did the same amount of the move at the same rate and in the exact same place in the arc, my skis, if I'm on a, on a, on a slalom race ski versus a big mountain, you know, it's maybe something 98 underfoot, 100 underfoot or bigger, the outcome is going to be different. Right. So no, even though I give the turn the same move, the ski is going to flex differently. Um, it's going to give us a different turn shape completely you know, anywhere from, you know, 13 meter to a 28 meter turning racing, you know, a racing GS ski, something like that. So two, two thoughts here. One, um, I definitely like to change my equipment up uh, when I'm developing a new move because it tells me you know, the results of that move. So when I'm out skiing and I, I arrive at the hill one day, I said, well, today I'm going to pull out my GS skis. They're going to be perfect for those long turns on that groom terrain. I do know that when I get into the bumps, if I stick that ski straight into the bump and I try to use the, you know, a little bit more of the ski design and a little less of the twisting move, uh, I'm going to have a bad day in the bumps, right? I'm going to get bucked all over the place. So, um, you know, I, as long as I know the results, uh, that I'm going to get the outcome based on a specific move, then I can vary my approach based on the equipment I'm on. So one of two choices, I think, A, you can take the the approach that, you know, I the move I'm working on today will be best felt or noticed if I'm on a carving ski versus a powder ski. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to take out the powder skis and I'm going to learn how to adapt my move to that so I still have the turn shape that I'm looking for. So a little bit of both in there in your approach, I think. Phenomenal. Um, and, and one more popped up. So uh, people are listening tonight, Warren, which is fantastic. Um, so, so Michael remarks that, uh, you know, he's, when he's following another skier, he recognizes he's, his, he's a different person. He knows he's his own skier. He knows who he is. And he understands that he's on different gear. So I think the equipment comments have been uh, understood and listened to. Would your goal, though, be when you're following that person to change your movements to create the same result than just tri strictly trying to mimic them in the way that they stand or the way that they're making their shorter radius ski work for them? Um, and just to sort of sum it up, that is, do I evaluate myself on movements or the outcome? Maybe you can help Michael with that. Uh, well, tonight really focused on evaluating your run based on the outcome, because at the end of the day, that's measurable, right? How much the ski skidded or carved, how tight you were in the fall line, how far across the slope you went, you know, linking and, and gliding from one direction change to the next. I, it's a great story. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, I have had the the great honor of being involved with four interski teams as a team member, assistant coach, and twice as the head coach. And as the head coach, you know, we're talking about ten of the most talented skiers and and experienced ski teachers in the country. And one of the the jobs at interski is to demonstrate on the on the demo slope, and we need to ski as a group synchronized, I guess would be the, the word to use. I like skiing in close proximity because synchronizing, and this really points to the answer to your question, is almost impossible. Uh, if I look at the, the inter-ski teams that I was a part of, that would be 40 members. Some did more than one uh, inter-ski. So let's say at least 30 to 32 different skiers, all trying to match a radius, all trying to match a rhythm so we look as a group skiing down the hill, you know, as as close to the same as possible. And what happens, though, is, you know, there will be times if the if the arc 
is what's defined, like it is in synchronized skiing, then you may have to modify uh, the rate of your move, the degree of your move, and the timing where you put it. But if you have to change your skiing completely uh, to match somebody else's turn shape, um, then I think that's going, you know, backwards, right? And, you know, I'm assuming that the, the turn, you know, that we put, you know, you're following somebody who's a stronger skier than you are. In that case, absolutely, you know, change your movements to match their movements and you're going to have a better chance of attaining the same arc. If you're on different equipment, just like we said in the previous answer, you're going to have to understand that you may have to add a little bit more twist or tip the ski over a little bit more to maintain synchronicity or the same turn shape. So I would evaluate the outcome if, it, if, if the ultimate goal of that run is to say synchronize with the person in front of you. Then after that, if the goal is to um, make the same movements and see what happens as far as your turn shape based on the fact of you know, your physical uh, setup, your equipment setup, then you know that would be a different approach to take then you're analyzing the out or the the movement but always tying it to the outcome as well awesome thanks warren um mark mark posted one up and i might might be able to help get us to that the response on that one a little quicker but uh mark was curious about you know how long should his skis feel flat before he starts his next turn and i think warren you've just been talking a lot about the outcome that you're trying to create and really understanding you know what are you going for right so is is it meant to be a turn that takes you a long way across the hill? You're changing direction more slowly, or is it something where you're trying to accomplish something a lot, a lot quicker uh, rate of response for your skis? But would you be able to speak to that for Mark for a little bit here? Just um, you know, understand that outcome he's looking for and what he's got to do to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know the 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 flat ski uh, challenge. <laughs> I, I I think in a perfect world, so. You know, we're, we're, we're always constantly changing the momentum of our skier, right? We're, we should always be on an arc. If I have the ski on any amount of edge, I'm going to be on an arc. The ski is going to bend a little bit and it's going to produce a, an arc for me. <clears throat> the flatter the ski is, the less the edge is going to take us on an arc, but it's going to, it's almost impossible with our equipment these days. And the fact you're even standing on a slope, you're always somewhat on edge. So, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> that sinking a, a flat ski um, is not something that, that I think we should be trying to do. If you want to widen the corridor of your run, you don't want to do that by traversing on a flat ski. You want to do that by changing the in, the, the rate and the degree of your movement to increase the edge and or decrease the edge. That would give us that width or that gliding. In a perfect world, if I was to sketch it out on a, you know, on a, on a, on a whiteboard, the flat portion uh, of my, you know, the, the, the turns would be only as long as my skis would be. So if I'm on a 180 centimeter long pair of skis, and you were to you know, walk back up the mountain and look at the track on the snow, I would only want to see it flat for that amount of time, for that distance, that 180 centimeters, because I want to be able to go from one outside ski to the next as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Awesome. And then uh, lastly, Lauren asked a question. This is, this is one, I think, for me this evening. How can we access the two earlier sessions uh, today for replay? Um, and there's been a few comments on some of the um, the shared documents, the PDF files that were available. So the you know summary of Tech Two um, and the the first talk. So if you're looking to access any of the previous content, if you have previously registered for these Tech Talks, you'll actually have an email that'll come to your inbox. For example, tonight's uh, session will arrive in your e inbox tomorrow morning at some point, um, but you should have a confirmation email from both session one and two. If you were not registered for those sessions, but would like to check them out, you can go to uh, csiontario.com. You'll find a tab there for Tech Talks, and all of the previous session videos are hosted there for you. So check those out at your convenience. You can share that content as well. 
And then I had a great comment from uh, Mary, just curious to, to grab the summary documents from Warren for session one and two, because she wasn't able to access those in the recordings. And uh, I'm pretty sure we would be able to host all that on the same tab. So I'll connect with uh, with our board and we'll get that stuff shared up there as well. So if you're having trouble tracking that down, um, feel free to reach out to us on social media, um, CSI Ontario, uh, Facebook or Instagram, um, or drop onto the CSI Ontario website there and you can find the recordings, but we're happy to help you if you're struggling with that. So not seeing any new questions popping up, I wanted to just, you know, summarize what I said earlier in the evening. Warren, uh, really thank you for taking us through these first three sessions. It's been a blast. Thank you so much for being our our inaugural presenter for uh, the 2021-22 season of Tech Talks. Um, to everybody who's tuned in from all regions and internationally uh, for three great sessions with Warren, thanks for being here. Uh, if you are new to this tonight, be sure to zip back and check out the previous ones. And uh, when we get into the new year and we have new new presenters and new topics coming your way, having signed up for previous sessions, we will be sure to notify you of that content uh, becoming available so you can log in and uh, enjoy it live the night of, or you can catch recordings after the fact. So as I said at the start, I hope you have a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, a safe and help healthy, Happy New Year. Um, I hope there's tons of time on snow for everyone and all of those training goals that uh, were being shared the last two sessions. Best of luck with them. Uh, I'm sure Warren's given us a lot to think about. So Warren, thank you. And thanks for everyone for being here. And we'll see you again soon, if not on snow sooner. Thank you, AJ. Thanks, everyone. Take care.